This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As Israel rejects the United Nations Security Council resolution calling for urgent and extended humanitarian pauses in Gaza, we're continuing to look at growing efforts to hold Israel legally accountable for war crimes in Gaza. Joining us from Berlin, Germany, is Chantal Maloney. She is an international criminal lawyer, international criminal law professor at the University of Milan in Italy. She's also senior legal advisor for international crimes accountability with the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights in Berlin. She also consults with the Palestinian Center for Human Rights and represents victims in Palestine before the International Criminal Court. She's the author of the book, Is There a Court for Gaza? Her new piece for Justice and Conflict is headlined, The War in Gaza, International Law is Nothing If It Is Not Applied. And with us in France is Reed Brody, longtime human rights attorney, war crimes prosecutor. Brody has been involved in several major war crimes cases, including against Chile's former dictator Augusto Pinochet, Haiti Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier, and the former Chadian dictator Hissène Habre. He's author of To Catch a Dictator, The Pursuit and Trial of Hissène Habre, and he's the son of a Hungarian Holocaust survivor. Reed's recent piece for The Nation is headlined, Gaza, Where is the Law? Chantal Maloney, let's begin with you. Where is the law? We are trying to reach um, a man you and Reed have worked closely with in Gaza, Raji Sarani, who lived in northern Gaza. His home was bombed, now forced to um, live in Khan Yunus, uh, and now parts of Khan Yunus have been covered with leaflets saying that those who are there must move further south. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me with you today. I think uh, that what we have witnessed in the past weeks, it's literally the commission on each and every international crime that you may find listed under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And I was listening very carefully to what my colleague Katie Gallagher just said before, their very, very important legal action in the U.S. And, of course, she started to uh, talk about the fact that Gaza is under blockade since 16 years. So I think we need to, we need to go back. We need to go back to 2007, and we need to go back to the first efforts that have been done already in 2009 to basically bring these violations and possible grave crimes to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. So let's just remember that it was already in January 2009 that the Palestinian Authority, so to say, knocked on the door of the International Criminal Court, lodging an Article 15.3, so an ad hoc acceptance of the jurisdiction of the ICC, in order to have these grave crimes that had already been committed during the Operation Kaslad uh, investigated and possibly prosecuted in The Hague. And I want to remember, really, the conclusions that already the UN fact-finding mission on the Gaza Strip, uh, the so-called Goldstone Report, uh, after the name of uh, Richard Goldstone, the famous uh, um, South African judge, uh, had reached in 2009, meaning that the closure of the Gaza Strip that had been imposed continuously since 2007 was unlawful, collective punishment of the civilian population of Gaza and a possible crime against humanity. The conclusions were in the sense of the commission of the crime of persecution, a very grave crime against humanity, exactly because there was this disproportionate collective punishment on an entire population, two million people of Gaza, with the declared purpose by the Israeli authorities to try to break their support to Hamas and therefore diminish, um, basically, um, their possibility, apparently, to, um, to commit anything that could be harmful for Israel. And already at that time, the fact-finding mission concluded that 
the series of acts that deprived the Palestinians in Gaza of their basic needs of subsistence, employment, housing, water, as well as, of course, their freedom of movement amounted to collective punishment and possible crime against humanity. So, what we have seen after that uh, is a very long and portrayed uh, now denial of justice, because we, while we are talking, it is 14 years later, we are still in a phase where we don't see any concrete steps uh, in The Hague at the ICC. The investigation is now formally open since 2021, but we have not seen any warrant of arrest uh, nor any concrete action. And Chantal, could you uh, talk more about this issue of uh, uh, what the Israel is, Israel's claim that they will take actions to make sure that Hamas uh, does not pose a threat uh, to Israel in any form? I just want to read a statement because, of course, what we hear again and again in light of Hamas's attack on October 7th is that Israel has the right to self-defense. And I just want to read a statement that a UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Francesca Albanese, recently made. She says that Israel cannot, quote, claim the right of self-defense against a threat that emanates from the territory that it occupies, from a territory that is kept under belligerent occupation. So if you could uh, explain that uh, and what the distinction is between two things, the fact that it is a, a territory that is occupied uh, by Israel, and second, that Hamas is, of course, not a state. It is a non-state actor that is uh, considered by Israel, the U.S., the U.K., uh, to be a terrorist organization. So what law applies in that case? Yes, exactly. It is very important to understand what is the law, the legal framework that applies to this, uh, because Gaza is still part of the occupied Palestinian territory, and Israel, uh, uh, regardless of the disengagement, uh, so the occupation changed its form in the Gaza Strip since 2006, but it didn't change substance, meaning that Israel is still uh, exercising effective control on the Gaza Strip and its entire population by different means, not anymore with boots on the ground, but rather through controlling uh, its borders, its aerial space, its uh, um, uh, sea, and, of course, also the civilian life. We have to remember that even uh, you know, the civilian registries uh, in uh, Gaza are still uh, basically kept uh, by the Israeli authorities. And as you know, of course, no one gets in and out of Gaza, not even the UN uh, functionaries, uh, not even international uh, experts uh, uh, comes into Gaza if Israel do not uh, allow this uh, from happening. So this is why uh, not the Palestinians, but also international bodies, the ICRC, the UN, have uh, uh, considered, and also the International Criminal Court, uh, that Gaza is still occupied territory. This means uh, that Israel bears uh, very specific duties and responsibilities with regard to the civilian population of Gaza. Not only they should not harm them, they should actually protect them. So, uh, what we are witnessing in these weeks, but honestly, what we have witnessed uh, in particular since 2007 on, it's um, a violation, a grave violation of international humanitarian law, also taking into account the very strong duty that is placed on Israel as occupying power. With regard to the specific question you were making, you were asking me about whether Israel can rely or not on self-defense with regard to Gaza and with regard to Hamas, not being Hamas a state, but a armed group that is considered to be a terrorist group internationally. So, I don't think, honestly, that this is um, the most important legal point uh, to be uh, disentangled. It is a very complex legal point, but it is only 
uh, if you want, it is only relevant if, you, if we want to discuss whether Israel's reaction to the grave uh, crimes committed by Hamas on the 7th of October is an act of, of aggression or not. The point is that regardless of what we think uh, in this regard, and I, I personally think that what Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur, is uh, arguing is uh, absolutely uh, reasonable and can be the line to be followed. But regardless of whether we agree with her and with other legal scholars uh, um, on this point, uh, the, the issue is that the response, uh, so uh, what Israel is doing after the 7th of October in Gaza, is in grave violations of international humanitarian law, meaning the law, the rules uh, that uh, regulate uh, war, the armed conflict. And so this is, for me, the most important point to make, regardless of the legitimacy or not uh, of uh, the intervention, we are witnesses very grave uh, crimes that can be analysed under the lenses of war crimes, of crimes against humanity, or, as we heard from Katie Gallagher and the CCR, genocide. Uh, Reid Brody, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. You wrote this piece for the nation called Gaza, Where is the Law? If you could lay out the argument you make in that piece uh, and the background that you give about the role in particular of the International Criminal Court in the past uh, in prosecuting sure. or not prosecuting uh, crimes that uh, Israel was accused of. Sure. I mean, as Chantal was saying, um, every attempt uh, by Palestinians, by Raji and others, um, to use the International Criminal Court uh, and other institutions of international justice to hold Israeli officials legally accountable has been sidelined or delegitimized as, as lawfare. I mean, as Chantal has said, um, the uh, ICC really subjected the uh, Palestinian complaints to this obstacle course over 15 years, um, to the point that in, in, all, in all of that time, um, there has been no, no charges have ever been brought. And this includes the things that, I mean, we're talking the decades of, of Israeli occupation, the collective punishment, the apartheid, um, the, uh, the war crimes that work, but the illegal settlements. Settlements are illegal under international law to bring your um, people into an occupied territory. And they have been given the go-slow treatment. Uh, first, it was the question of whether they were a state. The first prosecutor kicked the ball, spent three years looking at it and kicked the ball down the road. Uh, Fatou Ben Souda, the second prosecutor, um, spent five years uh, conducting a preliminary examination nation before uh, assuring um, that there was a, that there were grounds to believe that both Israel and and Palestinians had committed crimes um, including the settlements um, including war crimes um, and then she left it to the current prosecutor um, Karim Khan um, uh, when uh, the invasion when the Russian invasion compare this to the Russian so 15 years of no action. You compare this to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, right after the Russian invasion, it was the war crime started to mount. The International Criminal Court and, and most of the Western justice systems did what they were supposed to do. Immediately, uh, Karim Khan went to Ukraine, talked about it as a crime scene, um, raised an enormous amount of uh, money for the ICC's investigation, and has already, in fact, uh, uh, issued an arrest warrant against um, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, for uh, for the transfer of Ukrainian children. Compare that then to to Palestine, uh, where none of this has happened. Now we did see, and I think this is important. Um, uh, last week, the uh, prosecutor Kareem Khan, um, who has been you know criticized for not doing anything, for not moving, um, went finally to the Rafah crossing. Uh, he followed it up with a very powerful uh, speech uh, from Cairo, uh, in which he spoke. You know, he, he spoke about the crimes uh, that were, or he spoke about the allegations um, on both sides. Um, he spoke very bluntly. 
uh, in, in, in a way to the, to the Israeli authorities. He reminded them um, that, their con that the conduct of, of, the, uh, of the conflict has to respect the laws of war, distinction between civilian population uh, and, and military f uh, uh, objects, proportionality, precaution. Um, I think, as, as we can talk about, I, mean, I think these these are not being honored. Um, and he, but he was very clear to Israel um, that uh, that mosques, that churches, that houses, um, that hospitals um, have a protected status, uh, and that it is the uh, that the burden uh, is on the as he put it, those who fire the gun or the rocket or the missile to show that they've lost their protective status. Um, will, this, will, will this be followed up by real action for the first time? I mean, as many people have pointed out, the fact that there was no accountability for the, for the last decades of, uh, of, 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 of occupation and crimes related to the occupation has created a sense of impunity. Is that sense of are is you know are we going to finally deal with that sense of impunity? On Wednesday, Israel's deputy UN ambassador Jonathan Miller uh, claimed Israel always adheres to international law. This is what he said: Hamas is solely responsible for the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and they weaponized it to prevent Israel from defending itself. Israel does not need a resolution to remind us to adhere to international law. Israel always adheres to international law. So uh, that's Israel's deputy UN ambassador Jonathan Miller. Um, Reed, if you could respond to that and also talk about um, investigation of Hamas for war crimes. Sure. I mean, you know, the the, the core principles, as as everyone should know, regarding the laws of war is the protection of civilians. Uh, military operations can't be directed at civilians. Um, and that's expressed through in the, the principle of distinction. You have to make a distinction between civilian objects and military objects. Even, and, and this is, you know, like in the hospital case, even where you say um, that there is a military objective there, um, the leaders still have to act with proportionality. Um, they cannot just go and um, you know, and, and, and attack civilians um, in a way um, that is disproportionate. And and there's a one, one can argue about what disproportionate means under the law. It's um, where the that 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 an action is expected to cause uh, inc incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians um, that is um, excessive in relation to the military advantage. Advantage that's anticipated. It's very hard to see as we look at this conflict today. The 10,000 people who have been killed, 4,000, um, uh, uh, 4,600 children. Um, how these things uh, are considered uh, proportion? I think Israel has a heavy burden to bear here um, to show in any way um, that these actions uh, fit within the laws of the war. Um, you brought up Hamas's crimes, and I think we all believe and, and that Hamas, on October 7th, um, committed um, very serious uh, war crimes, probably crimes against humanity. Um, there, these do not—just as, just as the decades of crimes under Israeli occupation do not justify um, Hamas um, committing crimes against civilians, committing war crimes, those crimes um, by Hamas um, cannot in any way justify uh, further war crimes uh, and, and, and many of the actions that are being taken, undertaken by the Israeli armed forces today. And finally, Reid, <clears throat> you are the son of a Holocaust survivor, a Hungarian forced laborer. Um, can you talk about what this means to you? You're in France, you live in Barcelona, Spain. Um, uh, the issue of increased anti Semitism. And then also the equation of the criticizing of the Israeli state with anti Semitism. Well, those are a lot of questions to unpack. It's very diff difficult. I mean, it, I was in with Chantal actually in Germany last week, um, where it's very, very difficult um, to, uh, to criticize 
uh, the conduct of of, uh, of Israel, where, where the line is very thin. And as somebody who spent half my life in Europe, I'm also aware of how prevalent anti-Semitism is and how much um, uh, and, and how careful we have to be um, not to allow criticisms of Israel um, to spill over anti-Semitism and to be and 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 to be ruthless when we hear anti-Semitism. Um, uh, I, you know, I my I come to my positions as as an international lawyer, as a Jew, as a son of a Holocaust survivor. Um, I don't think that these things are can be conducted. Uh, in 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 my name, certainly. Um, obviously, in America and around the world, um, there are many Jews uh, have stood up and talked about uh, uh, the, uh, not in not in our name. In Europe, it's quite. I have to say, it, it, uh, in Spain, where I live, um, there are there are a lot fewer, and and it's 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 quite a big deal. Um, but next week, there's a rally in Paris on, uh, by Jews. Uh, who uh, who are against uh, what Israel is doing? I think more and more this is becoming a. Qu I mean, this is a question of humanity. Um, one Holocaust um, does not justify another. This is an. What happened to the my father's generation, to my father, to members of my family, um, was the was was a genocide. Um, uh, but just like war crimes don't justify other war crimes, there's an asymmetrism between what happened uh, with the Jews uh, uh, and, and, and what is happening today. And I don't think we can invoke the Holocaust, we can invoke what happened to our parents um, to allow uh, Israel to commit war crimes today. And Chantal, finally, we just have one minute, but if you could say whether the fact that Hamas has taken over 200 uh, hostages, 240 Israeli hostages into Gaza, what effect that has, what impact, whether there's any uh, allowance or what, what, the, what international law says can be done in the event of a hostage taking on this scale in terms of uh, the return of the hostages? I mean, if I understand correctly your question, of course, uh, also what Hamas did with regard to the hostage taking from from Israel, Israeli civilians, uh, uh, can amount to war crimes. is a violation of uh, the rules of international humanitarian law, and it will follow. It follows potentially under the jurisdiction of the. Now, what we really. And I think we will see an acceleration in the investigations of the international criminal are so dramatic. So, and I'm sure that the prosecutor will uh, analyze uh, 360 degrees the responsibilities, meaning both uh, the Israeli authorities and uh, the Palestinian armed groups. But we, what we really urgently need is accountability and to break this uh, circle of impunity, which fosters violence and has been already for too long. Uh, uh, denounce in, uh, in, in, in this way as one of the triggers uh, of the violence and brutality that we are witnessing today. Chantal Maloney, we want to thank you so much for being with us, international criminal lawyer, consulted with the Palestinian Center for Human Rights and represents victims in Palestine before the International Criminal Court, and Reed Brody, human rights attorney and war crimes prosecutor, son of a Hungarian Holocaust survivor. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.